Hey, what's up, everybody? Most of you know that Sagar is in Paris, France right now, but we recorded this interview with Spencer Ackerman of the Forever War Substack and the author of the newly released today, Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump. So we've got the two of us on this interview. So many good things here. I know there's going to be a lot of debate in the comments section about 9-11, what happened afterwards, and our decisions in Iraq and Afghanistan, especially coming into September when the Biden administration is set to withdraw U.S. forces from Afghanistan after 20 plus years of engagement in the country. So really great stuff here. Definitely go check out our bookshop and subscribe below if you haven't done so already. You can purchase Spencer's book at the bookshop there too, support a local bookseller, support Spencer's reporting, now that he's independent at Substack. And then also, of course, get a really good book that will help you think about the world. So much here. Let's get into the episode. Thanks for tuning in. Spencer Ackerman, welcome to The Realignment. Hey, thanks you guys for having me. Good to see you, Spencer. I want to start this with a very precise question that I don't want to sound insensitive, but should really shape how we approach this entire conversation about the legacy of the war on terror. A lot of the time when we think of this conversation, it's framed from the perspective of the war on terror being a failure. The Iraq war, a long presence in Afghanistan that ends inconclusively at best. But from the perspective of September 12th, 2001, when most people, we were just barely young enough to remember this, are thinking we never want to have another September 11th level event happen happen in this country again. I could see an argument that despite everything, the broader set of policies that were embarked upon worked. If you think about this in Cold War terms, you have the war in Vietnam, obviously a massive disaster and failure that leads to millions of deaths. You have horrible regimes in Latin America and the Asia Pacific that are supported. But at the end of the day, the U.S. still wins and the Soviet Union is contained and eventually collapses in 1991. So how should we think of the war on terror, given the context that I just gave you? So I would not really agree with that framing. I think it kind of leads out the exceptional nature of the 9-11 attack itself. This was the high watermark of what Al-Qaeda was ever able to achieve. And viewing in terms of a repeat of that particular attack, which you heard again and again and again uh, from senior political leaders of both parties and the security barons, uh, the intelligence agencies, the military, law enforcement, the homeland security apparatus is the predication for everything that it was doing is a really distorting prism. And uh, there's a quote, I think it was Arthur Schlesinger Jr. about third parties. I'm, I'm, I'm going to mess that up. I forget. But the, the quote, the aspect of the quote that I like is that it was like, you know, third parties are like bees. Once they sting, they die. And, you know, it's a little bit too pat to say that, like, Al Qaeda would have died after that. But like all of the inherent difficulties, both in planning and logistics of maneuvering everything into place for the 9-11 attacks, to have that happen again, it's pretty unrealistic, especially once the country is aware that there is such a thing. As Al Qaeda, so I don't really think you can you can judge it on those terms. You also, when you look through the accounts of all of the compounding security failures that happen to allow 9/11 to proceed, you can also see ways in which, for the particular event, the attack itself, this was a preventable thing. It was preventable before it happened, and. In place of that was incalculable damage done to not only hundreds of thousands of human beings who are dead now, the creation of tens of millions of refugees, the exact number is disputed, but also a aggressive and ongoing erosion of democratic institutions institutions that 
no longer essentially constrain the security state all under this atmosphere of righteous patriotic violence that never ends, that continues to this day, then I think if you view it in terms of, well, we, pre- we you know, prevented another 9-11, there's always going to be terrorism. There's always going to be, as long as America plays the imperial role that it plays overseas, as long as America is committed to being a global hegemon, that is going to attract and inspire resistance. As long as the United States has a war on terror, it will find people to fight. So, Spencer, here's where I'm curious. When did the war on terror go wrong? Was it the day we passed the Patriot Act? Was it uh, the, I forget the, I think it was a September or October meeting where Paul Wolfowitz brings up Iraq? Was it December of 2001 when we make the decision not to go after bin Laden and we transition to democracy building and then we transition to Iraq? Like, take us through that timeline and let's contextualize it as much as we can. We have some listeners who weren't even alive on September 11th or were like one or two years old. So they don't, I mean, like Marshall said, I think I was, so I think I was like fourth eight. grade. Yeah, it was fourth grade Oof. whenever this happened. So like for me, I was watching it on TV. Um, so I was aware these things are happening. The significance didn't become aware until I myself became very interested in the war in Afghanistan and more when I you know turned 18, 10 years later. Um, and so you're going back and like re you know understanding the events more. But you know you're a child, and then con- you know even more so when people who don't even know what's happening and it's literally ancient history. So. Yeah. Take people through the early days of the war on terror. Where did it go wrong in your view? So I, there is, it's a great question. And there's a lot of stuff there programmatically. I, I will point in a moment to um, certain acts of policy and then acts of strategy uh, that, that go off the rails in directed material ways. But I think where the war on terror goes wrong is conceptual and fundamentally so. Um, Most importantly, this is something that I kind of bring up throughout the book and a theme that I return to again and again is like the ratchet of the war on terror kind of Mm -hmm. keeps keeps turning. But fundamentally, um, on September 14th, uh, Congress passes a 60 word uh, quasi law known as the authorization to use military force. And the authorization to use military force is supposed to be the document of congressional assent that permits uh, the war to proceed. And when you read those 60 words, uh, the imprecision of them is overwhelming. It's the most present thing in the text. Uh, It provides... Uh, for an enemy. It provides for for actions against an enemy that, crucially, it does not define. It does not limit those operations by time or by space. But there's one really crucial element of the so-called AUMF that is very precise, and that's who gets to decide all of this. And it's very specific when it says the president gets to decide that. Mm -hmm. There is, of course, a very long legacy before 9-11 of the presidency, you know, depending on how you put it, you know, usurping uh, constitutional powers, constitutionally delineated powers uh, to Congress, um, I would argue as well from the judiciary, and that really shows itself throughout the 9-11 era. But At that moment, a certain threshold is crossed and the presidency in matters of national security, at least, kind of becomes an elected king. And the ability to limit the power of that executive, it's always going to be a tremendous struggle. And this isn't an accident and it's not an imprecision brought upon by you know, the heady days and the panic in the aftermath of the era, it's very deliberate. 
And architects like John Yu, the former Justice Department official in the Bush administration, talk about this from a matter of principle, that not only are you know you and his colleagues trying, Dick Cheney is a, is a very big proponent of this, trying to correct what they see as the erosion of presidential power, but saying that in order to do that, The presidency has to be understood as invested with this overwhelming constitutional authority during times of war that renders those decisions appropriately from the perspective of the Constitution on this theory beyond normal political and legal review. So here we now have an all powerful president that can define a war against an enemy that he can continuously redefine. That, I think, more than all of the tools that arise after is kind of the fundamental mistake. And one of the reasons it's a fundamental mistake, I'll wrap up. I promise I won't. No, this is good. Please keep going. I won't belabor belabor your point too much on this. But um, one of the reasons that it's so important to understand that imprecision is that the enemy itself isn't particularly defined like very well ever. And once that happens, it's always going to be a matter of political dispute when someone puts forward the idea that like, well, we've done the job, the war is over. Uh, We did what we came here to do and it's done. Because there are, once you say like the president has the power to define and then, you know, they don't use this word, but functionally avenge, uh, however he or she understands the uh, the danger posed uh, from terrorism against the United States, it very quickly, you know, moves beyond the people and entities responsible for 9-11 into something far broader. You're always going to have both an ability to, in this country, dispute where the just, ba- where, where the appropriate boundaries of the war are and how and when it ends. And Once that happens, you really do have really an endless war. Um, You you have that in a way that metaphysically exists kind of outside and before any specific operations, military, intelligence, law enforcement, homeland security um, of that war. And, you know, later in the book, I, I look at, you know, some of the moments when the United States kind of has the choice available to say, well, we did this thing and, and now this is over and then doesn't. And, you know, most importantly in the book, um, I view and, you know, bring it up as uh, one of the most horrific mistakes of Barack Obama's presidency um, when he's handed an opportunity to kill Osama bin Laden to not say after he's done that, it's been 10 years, it's been arduous, it's been awful. But now, you know, there's a natural point at which you could argue probably more than any other competing interpretation that with the death of bin Laden, the war on terror is over. And Obama, for a variety of reasons I discuss in the book, explicitly chooses not to do that and to do the opposite. And then we really are kind of unmoored forever in the 9-11. Libya happens that year. Well, right. so this is yeah. this is where Spencer. Here's the problem: you're throwing 15 different fascinating things at us at once. So we're going to pick these in no particular order. Apologies to people who want to follow an outline. To what degree does a president like Obama have the choice to make the statement that you made? In the sense that, look, he didn't seek seriously to retain a U.S. military presence in Iraq after the Bush administration and his administration failed to negotiate a status of forces agreement. So the U S was set to leave Iraq anyways, after 2011. Uh, so that was already going that the right direction in terms of withdrawing from that conflict. But then ISIS happens, the Arab spring happens to what degree would Obama making the statement that this war and terror is happening actually lead to the policy outcome you're looking at. Because from my perspective, let's say he gave that speech. And and it's funny, Sagar and I were at George Washington University in 2011. So we were at the White House. Oh, wow. The day. So we yeah. were there, right? We so were like, outside. We were some of the first 200 people outside the White House after so, bin Laden was killed. 
So, so we remember the energy there, and I entirely understand what you're talking about, where I can imagine a world where the next morning he gives a very Obama lofty rhetoric speech about the war on terror ending. But then the next year, Iraq would have collapsed back into chaos, and ISIS would have risen, and Syria would have continued to escalate, and those same choices would have come up again. So I just want you to talk about the Obama part of that angle. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I brought that question directly um, in the book to Ben Rhodes, who is Obama's, you know, probably most uh, aligned uh, foreign policy aide in his brain trust. And, you know, his perspective, you know, speaks directly to your question that like, come on, like the political consequences of saying the war is over, particularly when there's another, you know, terror attack, as there inevitably will be. Um, are going to be quite high. I don't diminish that at all. It absolutely would have been the case. Everyone remembers uh, what the political environment that Obama faced was. Um, but nevertheless, it was the right thing to do. Nevertheless, the abolition of the war on terror, which Obama never, ever pursues, um, it's a real constraint on him politically. But it's always going to be a constraint. And it will always grow as more of a constraint when there aren't political leaders who say, this is over. The way we've responded to 9-11 has made everything worse. If we continue to do that, it will continue to get worse. The standard of there not being another terrorist attack is completely unrealistic. It's also not something that if America, it, it's something that if America is really serious about, it has to look at itself internally and look at what it does in the world. Look at how the overwhelming impact it has on the lives of hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, by the fact of it being an imperial power, or if you, if you don't like that term, the hegemonic global power uh, around which what it calls the rules-based international order, a phrase I think is pretty disgusting, um, and conceals a lot more than it reveals. Nevertheless, it's the axis around which that whole thing rotates. That's always going to generate resistance. The more violently and less discriminately America acts, which is baked into the war on terror, the more resistance is going to arise. I don't disagree with you at all that if I got what I wanted and the end of the war on terror happens after bin Laden, ISIS would have still conquered um, Mosul. It would have conquered Raqqa. It would have very likely gone, you know, who knows, perhaps, perhaps, you know, further south toward Baghdad. Um, but that can't be viewed outside the context of the war on terror that created ISIS. As long as we stay in this paradigm, we're going to be locked into precisely this binary circumstance in which the reactions make everything worse, but the path dependency is committed to those reactions, that there's no way of getting out. You look at what Biden is doing with allegedly withdrawing from Afghanistan. Yes, the troop withdrawal will happen. But if you listen to General McKenzie, if you listen to Secretary Austin, if you listen to the security apparatus, as well as those in the administration and in Congress um, who identify themselves with, with that apparatus, they talk about how very willing they will be to continue surveilling and bombing Afghanistan. That is not a departure from the war on terror. That's the war on terror. It's just not pursued at 30,000 feet. It's pursued perhaps more at 10,000 feet, but the wheels on that plane don't touch the ground. And as long as that happens, we're going to be locked into this violent, awful circumstance that kills people and takes away their freedom because the only tools we use here are tools that produce these consequences. And unless leaders have the strength, the wisdom, and the determination to say, I'm going to take this argument on head on in all of its complexity, but without sacrificing a basic moral clarity about the relationship between terrorism and counterterrorism, we're just, if, if that doesn't happen, we're just going to be locked into this endlessly. So who is gonna really do that? Mm -hmm. Who is really gonna take up that charge? The, the quick follow-up that I'm curious around is I'd like you to help Sagar and I, and probably most of our audience work through 
it's not quite a contradiction, but it's something difficult, which is that I'm someone, once again, I was in fifth grade, so my opinion does not count, who opposed the war in Iraq. But I also am most sympathetic, especially during the debate over the surge, to the you break it, you buy it problem. Um, so for example, you're talking about the war on terror as being something that leads to millions, um, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of deaths, displacement across entire continents. That's all true. But from the perspective of Iraq in 2011, an America that stayed and continued its presence in a way that, once again, there's still violence, but from 2009 to 2011 was far lower than what came afterwards was so different. The, the, the Iraq that we see in 2013 to 2017 is a million times worse from my perspective than the Iraq we saw during a U.S. occupation after 2008, 2009. So can you just help me sort through that part? If we are saying one of the metrics we're judging how bad this policy is by the degree of state collapse, by the degree of Iraqi state officials are going through hospitals and murdering ethnic minorities. How, how do we think through that? Because I'm just so conflicted between those two things. Sure. And it's a great question. Um, so first of all, the death squads uh, that exist during the U.S. occupation are tied intimately to the U.S. training the Iraqi security forces. I was in Baghdad in March of 2007. Among the things I saw um, was the police stations stuffed to the brim with people. Um, and I talked to the Iraqi uh, police, you know, in charge of, of those jails and, you know, asked about, like, who are your police? And among, you know, the the answers that I got back was like, it was pretty obvious that you know, at that period, this is the dawn of the surge. Um, there is a very porous distinction uh, between police and a militia, better understood as a death squad. And the answer I would get back um, from police sometimes is like, just because he's in a militia doesn't mean he can't do his job. Th where I'm going with this is that these mechanisms of extremely violent repression are not alternatives to the occupation of Iraq. They are the occupation of Iraq. And when, as with the surge, the violence gets brought down somewhat, the idea is, you know, behind the surge, supposedly, is that like, well, once that happens, then the arduous work of Iraqi politics can take place and knit the country back into something stable. I, I think it's facile to the point of a lie to call it democratic, but nevertheless, something that what the United States was really after in that case was a reliable proxy for U.S. power and someone that would and, and a country that would host um, the American military, particularly as it looks um, eastward toward Iran. But what happens instead is none of that happens. The theory is just wrong. The theory ultimately becomes that uh, as America pulls back from the war, um, Iraqi politics are not in fact solved. And what the Iraqi political elite, at least some of them, um, particularly, I shouldn't say the political elite, what the Iraqi security elite wanted was an indefinite American presence in order to forestall a return to bloodshed. The return to bloodshed happened. The United States demonstrated that in staying or in going, it can't prevent it but it certainly can create the conditions for more of it. Should Obama have gone back to war against ISIS? I personally don't think so. I think that, you know, ultimately we're only going to get further down the road in this really awful dialectic, except in this case, the United States will also be killing vastly more people and committing itself to a foreign policy that ensures ever more of this kind of violence um, is what our future is to ever more diminishing returns. Yeah, I'm really- that, Does that this. help address that at all or does- um, yeah, 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 sorry, please. Yeah, I've held the mic. Well, no, it's fine. I'm just, I'm really torn on this because I'm like with Marshall, like, I mean, 2007, we invaded this country for no fucking reason and unleashed chaos 
on these poor people. And I'm not saying that, you know, I, I'm not saying about building democracy, none of that. But like when people are going around drilling, uh, drilling into little kids heads in the streets, it's like, and we are the direct cause. I do feel we have some responsibility. That being said, Spencer, I kind of agree with you, which is that what happened in Iraq after we left is basically what red pilled me, quote unquote, on Afghanistan. Is the more I covered the Afghan war, I was like, there is nothing we can do in this country. There was like nothing. I was like, the Taliban is fighting the Afghan government, which is corrupt as hell, and in some cases is even worse than the Taliban in the way that they govern the country. We spent a hundred billion dollars on these people. They have no desire whatsoever. Afghan politics actually is intrinsically linked to like brutal tribal warfare. Um, and and look, I that there's no other way to say it. Like I, I, I don't know what else. And in a way, I respected the hell out of Joe Biden. I think it was Nora O'Donnell who pressed him and was like, "Don't you have responsibility for if the Taliban takes over the country?" He's like, "No." He's like, "I don't have responsibility for it." He's like, "We've been doing this, and ultimately, the real answer is is that all we could do is sit there and forestall some strange quasi thing where the Taliban rules half the country and the Afghan National Security Forces quasi rule the other half, and it's just like a patronage game. So." I'm just curious, like, from your thinking and perspective there, because saying, by the way, in the year 2021, the U.S. shouldn't have done anything about ISIS is not that hot of a take. But think about 2000. What was it? 2014. I wrote um, it at the time. Yeah. Then, but yeah, no, I, I know. Mean, that's that's why I'm curious. Like, how did you get there so quickly? As in Baghdadi takes over Mosul. Um, what the Paris happens? All the Paris the, attacks. Yep. Yeah. I mean, Belgium. I mean, I actually remember, I think I was in a movie theater the day after Paris attack. I'm be honest, I was scared shitless. I saw some guy got get up with a backpack and I was like, oh man, I was like, this is scary stuff. Like, you know, I'm trying to put my mind back in that time. Yeah. Like how exactly did your thinking um, evolve on this? So like I said, um, by that point, especially I had reported repeatedly um, from Iraq and Afghanistan um, I don't know if you guys have been over there. Um, you're certainly younger than I am. Yeah. Um, that just seeing it changes you, I think, in important ways and takes this away from being a spectacle that most of us uh, only experience as a media event that, you know, we turn on the television um, or we doom scroll. And then when it gets too awful and unsatisfactory, we have the luxury of, you know, turning our phone off or turning the TV off or something like that. And that's not the case when you're there. It's not the case when, when you're in it. And one of the things that, that seeing this up close drilled into me was that like the forces of disaster, of destruction, of violence, of chaos, of repression, that like that, the wine spilled out of the bottle. Mm -hmm. Like, you can perhaps like get a paper towel and clean up some of it, but you're not going to clean up all of it. And as you try and clean it up more, you're going to be knocking, this metaphor is getting out of control, so I apologize. <laughs> you're going to be like knocking over more, more stuff <laughs> like in, in your room, and then you have to clean up after that as well. Like one of the things that, I don't mean this disrespectfully to either of you guys, but like something that, that I've encountered as a reporter um, when, you know, talking um, around these questions before, when, you know, people talk about responsibilities that the United States has, I think the United States has responsibilities to people, but it doesn't have the responsibility to do something it has no capacity to do, mm -hmm. which is lift countries that it has broken and that were broken in important ways before the United States gets there as well into something of the sort that George W. Bush described um, Iraq and Afghanistan and, you know, everywhere else um, that the war on terror occurred ultimately becoming, you know, the philosophers say that ought to say that to ought to do something ought implies can, that you can do that thing. I don't wish to say America has no responsibility and America has no culpability. The whole point of writing this book is talking about how we reckon with that tremendous responsibility for what America has done, not just to the world, but to itself in the name of counterterrorism. But 
if you say that you have a responsibility to get Iraq or Afghanistan back to some kind of status quo ante, when does it stop? Yeah, when, 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 is the job, when is the job finished? When does the United States say its responsibility is finished? I personally don't think responsibility as a concept kind of works that way. Mm. I view responsibility like I view solidarity. It's things that we owe to one another continuously as people who live in a society. Doing this at the point of a gun, responsibility, I think that term ends up concealing more than it's revealing. And what it conceals is what is done to people in the name of that responsibility. I think that's a really excellent point. I want to take it just a little bit higher level because you mentioned Bush. How much do the individual actors matter here? Um, Because something I saw during Trump, and you already alluded to this, is that you may have a president who wants to get out. And as you point out in your book, like, you know, say you want to get out, but like you also ramp up special forces, you unleash the military rules of engagement, all that stuff, all of that dichotomy being true. I interviewed Trump four times. I think he legitimately did want to get out of Afghanistan. I think the problem was that, frankly, he was too dumb to understand what that meant in terms of execution, as in he would get played by Mattis and the generals like every time. On Syria, they'd be like, yeah, 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 you can withdraw, but give us six more months. And they and after six months come, and he would be like, hey, we're getting out. And they're like, no, whoa, we can't do that. We gotta do this. It seemed to me that he got played by the institutional infrastructure I think it's probably fair to say the same thing happened to Obama overall. And again, you put yourself back in 2009. Yes, Obama made the decision to do the surge, but Petraeus and the generals really boxed him in within the political context of the time. We're leaking against him constantly in the New York Times to calling up Bob Woodward. The you know John McCain still apparently had some credibility in our society at the time and is like pressuring Obama in there from the right. Obviously, I blame Obama there for Libya, but I mean, one thing I do respect Biden for is he actually did stand up to those forces within his administration, even though Mark Milley and these people tried everything they possibly could. And he was like, no, it's not happening. We're getting out. And to to be clear, you're not wrong. The bombing campaigns and all that will continue. But not having American combat troops stepping on landmines in Kandahar province for no reason is a win, I guess, you know, after 21 years. So I'm curious for how much do the individual presidents matter? And then how much does the archetypal military industrial complex, all of that actually rule policy once the war and all that starts going on? So I am never going to be someone um, who says that the individual, you know, who's the president doesn't matter. The president matters a lot. The president is not supremely powerful inside the American system, but is extremely powerful. And presidents who want to exercise that power alongside the prerogatives of the security state, George W. Bush, for instance, they're going to be extremely powerful, resisting the prerogatives of the security state. Then politics is going to happen. If presidents aren't prepared to actually conduct those politics to build, well, I don't want to say build because I think movements create presidents and not the other way around, but unless there is a popular movement, unless there is an understanding that the public, as I think is really proven um, over the course of the past you know, certainly 10 years, you can certainly, you know, go back 15, you could argue, you know, perhaps close to 20. The public, the American people does not want an endless war. But if the president of the United States is not willing to champion what it means to actually withdraw, then that's exactly what we're going to get. Presidents of both parties want to defer having this clash. They want to defer having for all of the obvious reasons. Um, the difficult choice of saying to the military and the intelligence um, apparatus and so forth, you know, we're not going to do this anymore. And then they have to fight and they have to resist. They have to, you know, we see from both Obama and Trump that resistance is going to be very formidable and it may very well carry the day. But if you don't wage it, 
what's the point of being president? Yeah. And I would just add to that as well. The wars themselves, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Pakistan, Somalia, Mali, they're the outward, obvious manifestations of the war on terror. The war on terror is much deeper than that. It is the surveillance apparatus that not only um, renders, this is my argument, you might disagree with it, um, the Fourth Amendment quaint. There really is no more Fourth Amendment in this country. There's the prerogatives of the FBI, the NSA, and the Justice Department for how much formally to apply them in given cases. But once the NSA after 9-11, under Mike Hayden, hashtag resistance hero, unleashes the NSA from the prior regime known as FISA in 1978, a compromise for how to conduct national security surveillance on persons inside the United States. Once in secret, Hayden, with the support of Cheney, rewrites in practice the NSA's operating guidelines and principles to allow for the bulk collection of Americans, both domestic and international communications records. That is the real war on terror. And now, because of the way the economy has changed to what um, the Harvard Business School professor Emerita Shoshana Zuboff called surveillance capitalism. It is now symbiotic, that surveillance, with our economy right now. There's no way, basically, one of the ways we saw after um, the surveillance was legalized in 2008, I was one of the reporters um, who worked for The Guardian on the Snowden leaks. So I got mm-hmm. to see some of this in ways that, let me just tell you, as a national security reporter, I've been reporting on this since it became public around 2005. I never expected um, to, to you know, see on paper you know, in front of me. But it became very clear through the descriptions of a surveillance activity with the code name of PRISM that the NSA no longer needed a panopticon because the data giants of surveillance capitalism the social media companies already have one. And it has one that is both, in a fundamental sense, extractive and exploitative of everyone who uses it. We create, the reason why all of these programs and platforms are free for us to use is so we can generate data that can be aggregated, that can be uh, commodified, that can be arbitraged, and that can be mined and sifted to continue to, to generate this kind of like theoretical wealth um, for others that we never get to experience or, or use for ourselves. That's achieved a kind of escape velocity, and that is entirely agnostic as to whether an advertiser exploits it or whether the NSA exploits it. That is kind of a long way and a bit of a rant of what I was kind of getting at about like what it will mean for a president to say, like, I want to end the war. It's well and good. And I don't want I I don't want to say it's well and good. I agree with you uh, that it's important to no longer fight a ground war in Afghanistan. I don't want to diminish that at all. But that's where ending the war on terror, abolishing the war on terror starts. And very, very often, that's where, in practice, the politics of the war on terror wants it to stop. Yep. So here's a bigger, bigger picture question I want to ask, because I'm interested in your broad critique of post-Cold War American foreign policy that's implicitly being made here. Because what's interesting to me is if you actually look back to George W. Bush, before he becomes president in 2000. If you look at what he's saying, or if you look at what Condoleezza Rice is saying is being articulated in places like foreign affairs, the Clinton administration is too interventionist. Mm -hmm. It's too focused on remaking the world in these different ideological ways. And once again, we all know what happens after September 11th. We've covered that here, so I'm not trying to make a point of he shifted in hypocrisy. But I think my point there is that what ended up happening isn't a conspiracy theory, but you had a person 
with a weak vision for foreign policy that didn't actually have the ability to help him make the right decisions after something happens on a really impactful level. So it's easy to say, oh, look, the Clinton administration, they had all these interventions. I never would have gone to Somalia. I wouldn't have engaged in Yugoslavia the way he did. But then when actually September 11th happens, saying I don't want to do X, Y, and Z is not enough of a framework or even a positive vision for not going the exact opposite direction. That's what you really see happening there. And that leaves you up to capture when it comes to various neoconservatives, various defense hawks, all these different ideological pools that are the same, but are also different. I hate when people call Donald Rumsfeld a neocon. He was not a neocon. Never these was. Are very, these are, Never it's, was. it's the most, it's the most, it's Crazy. like, no, no, no. These, these, it's, these are not understanding the differences there is actually deeply important to this broader story. And I'm sure we can get to into different contexts. But all I'm just saying is, can you offer up your sort of perception of what the alternative vision could have been emerging out of the post-Cold War moment that consistently I feel as if people that are critiquing what we did have a weak time actually articulating, which leads them to keep on the path that they're already on. Yeah, I think that's right. And I would say, um, first is a threshold question with you know George W. Bush and running for president in 2000. I would say when looking also um, at pretty much everyone who runs for president after that, with the partial exception of Mitt Romney and before with Bill Clinton, and I guess another exception, an important exception is is Hillary Clinton in 2016. Typically what they say is we're going to do less. We're going to do less war. We're going to do less overseas. We're going to reinvest in the United States and blah, blah, blah. And all of no this. stupid wars. That's yeah, the and all of this quote. and all of this bullshit. And then in practice, it looks a whole lot different. Um, I think the right thing to do after the post cold after the Cold War ends is to actively dismantle the apparatus that made the United States a hegemonic superpower. There are lots of different aspects of that, but what you would, I would, you know, you asked me the question, so I'll just speak for myself. Mm -hmm. You want to replace that with a series of institutions that favor democratic accountability, shared wealth. We may disagree on this, but I mean by that redistributed wealth, Uh, wealth that goes to the people who generate it the working people who generate it, not the people who exploit them uh, and financialize um, even beyond the people who exploit them, uh, the future expectations of the wealth that they create um, and yield in its place that kind of durable mechanism in both particulars and in, um, you know, broadly aggregate that allow for a world that can be effectively governed democratically in a way that scales up from the local to the global. If I had, you know, that's that's generally the vision. Um, you know, if, if if I had like a more sophisticated way and a more programmatic way of like what that would have looked like, I probably wouldn't be a reporter. I would probably <laughs> like, I don't know, try and rule the world, which I have absolutely no interest in doing. But you, you see what you see, you know, to be a little bit less flip, like, does that make any sense? Does that like satisfy? Like, I'm sure you could, you know, poke whatever holes in it. You would yeah, like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to poke. What, wait, let me put it a better way. I don't want to poke holes because that's boring. What I want to say though is to what degree do you think, especially when it comes to Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, to what degree do you think is there a good faith critique of post-Cold War American hegemony. So for example, you're talking about democratic distribution, wealth, et cetera. Osama bin Laden and the fighters of Al-Qaeda are not dilapidated subsistence farmers. Who totally, are they're at, men with who, degrees. Exactly, so, degrees. So, so we're not talking about, at least yeah. on the Al-Qaeda level, we are not talking about a revolt of the post-Cold War orders losers. We are not talking about people who I feel are making a deep systemic critique that I think is being uttered in good faith. I think this is probably a side of me that's philosophically conservative, but I think we're talking about an evil person 
Osama bin Laden is a spoiled child of a wealthy Saudi family. He He's one of power. the rich people yeah. alive. He <laughs> like we view Osama bin Laden in the context of however many psychotic billionaires exist in the world at whose pleasure the rest of us are expected to live. But that's my point, I, though. My point. Yeah, my no, no, my, no, my, my point mean. is Osama bin. I'm, I'm, that, 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 yeah. So get, yeah. Yeah. So all I'm saying is yeah. Looking at that profile of Osama bin Laden and the folks who he brought into those Al Qaeda training camps and who launched this attack, I do not get the perception that they are looking at wealth distribution and institutions and those fair things that actors could have done differently. So that's the question yeah. I'm asking you. Well, Marshall, you correctly identify that Osama bin Laden does not agree with my critique. Uh, I have my problems with Osama bin Laden's critique as well. Um, but where oh, sorry, I what think, is his, what, what his, no, good, wait, let, what is his critique? Well, please let actually, me get there. Cause this okay. is exactly yeah. what I'm going to say next. Cause what happens, I talk about this in the book is that America decides to listen to half of bin Laden's critique. The half that is the least is, is the most inscrutable. The half that speaks to a justification um, that he tries to locate in a religion that most Americans don't practice and most Americans are really unfamiliar with. And he does so in a manner that is also unfamiliar and monstrous to most of the people in the world who practice that religion. That's half of it. America looks at that and says, ah, that's why he did what he did, because he believes in that kind of religion. And that's not really right. When you look at the critique that bin Laden puts out there, and I'm not saying you have to agree with it, I certainly do not agree with it, but it has real material heft to it. It talks about specific circumstances of America acting imperially. It has no, it has really kind of like nothing to say outside of a kind of like vulgar nationalist sense um, about wealth extraction. It's certainly there. He doesn't, he's not talking about like greater mechanisms of democratic accountability. But what he is talking about is saying, look at what the United States does in the world. Look at the hundreds of thousands. I understand this number is actually in dispute. So however many it was, uh, starving children in Iraq under the UN oil for food sanctions. Look at the ways in which Again, you kind of have to like recognize that this is someone who sees this issue probably extremely differently than you or I. But he's saying in Saudi Arabia, you have an American apostate presence that's absolutely intolerable and intolerable because it subordinates whatever legitimacy. I mean, bin Laden very quickly like abandons the idea that the Saudi royal family is legitimate. But at least right. after 1991, he agrees with that. He is willing. He like explicitly offers to defend um, the Saudi royal family against um, Saddam Hussein. The point I'm getting at is that bin Laden rattles off, especially American support of Israel and the Israeli destruction of Palestine. He rattles off again and again material circumstances that are functionally imperial choices that America makes. And America decides to ignore that. And that is a really dangerous thing because that unmoors the war on terror and any critique of 9 11 and what leads to it from those material circumstances of American empire. I am not saying you have to, you know, to, to do the drill meme for a second, you absolutely do not have to hand it to Osama bin Laden. <laughs> I am not saying that. I am not saying that at all. What I'm saying is America makes a very fateful choice to only listen to part of this and not the whole. And the consequences of that material of that choice are felt by hundreds of millions of people around the world. It is felt very directly at home. It is felt extremely directly by the Islamic world, which comes to see America, if it didn't in that moment, certainly comes to see it as a threat um, for a lot of people uh, to their lives, particularly people who just, and this is the case of most people who experience war. Everyone who has done war reporting, encounters such people. They want what everyone wants. They want to survive this. They want to be left alone from it. They want to not come under the gaze 
of the people with the guns. And now the people with the guns are coming closer and closer and they don't speak the language. They don't understand the culture. They are here for their interests while saying they're here for yours. For a whole lot of people, that is going to say, that is going to tell them, I don't have much of a choice except to resist that. I have no choice except to resist that violently. There are a whole lot of ways in which that plays out. It certainly plays out in Iraq. It certainly plays out in Afghanistan. And it plays out beyond. It is what leads to ISIS. Um, and, you know, it's interesting you mention, because I, I, I do get into this in kind of the back half of the book after um, the result of a really enlightening conversation uh, several years ago with someone who defected from Al Qaeda. And this was around the time um, of, I want to say it was like 2015, 16, something like that. So like basically like the ISIS so-called caliphate um, sure. is, is in existence and everyone's, you know, trying to figure out dealing with it. And one of the questions I asked this person was like, what's the difference as you see it from like the person who joins Al Qaeda and the person who joins ISIS? And I got a huge class critique that I had not appreciated and was not previously aware of. And um, you will see this as well um, in chapter seven of the book from different people who um, me and my colleagues interviewed when we were at The Guardian, um, who were high ranking clerics in Al Qaeda, people who had spent decades finding religious justifications for mass murder. And what they said uniformly is like, there were enlightened, educated people within Al Qaeda. What they don't say at that point is rich people but rich people. And they had sensible, they would honestly say, and they do say, civilized understandings of how to appropriately conduct jihad. And then it all got spun up out of control when this tattooed former pimp thug named Abu Musab al-Zarqawi rises to power in Iraq because of the US occupation and creates al-Qaeda in Iraq. At that point, Al Qaeda, you like this in, in, in a way that's just sort of like surreal to remember and was, you know, an amazing thing to revisit when I went back through my and other people's contemporaneous reporting. Bin Laden, his deputy Ayman al Zawari, and other elements in Al Qaeda, starting in 2004, are trying to tell Zarqawi, will you please just fucking chill? Like, <laughs> you are like, yeah, like we stop, are stop, dude. Yeah, like, like, we're talking about what he was doing. What was he like? Right. We know the context. What was he right. doing? That was because this is the crazy part. I mean, what was he doing? Yeah. So Abu Musab al Zarqawi starts um, what I believe the first translation of the the name of the organization was like the front for monotheism and jihad. Um, mm -hmm. He transitions that basically like he takes over Al Qaeda like a rogue franchisee who decides like. I run Kentucky Fried Chicken now. <laughs> like, you know, I'm I, like, I'm the most relevant and the most, because of, you know, Iraq is the most relevant theater in this war against um, the infidel. Um, so, you know, Abu Musab al Zarqawi has a lot less of a material critique. Um, than bin Laden he's, does. Because, he's just a psychopath. Like, yeah, that's he's what just, he is. He's just like a total he's, sociopath. He's, he's interested right. in violence. He's interested right. in mass violence. And most of the people he's interested in directing that violence at are other Muslims who he considers to be illegitimately so or insufficiently so. Now, Zarqawi is not particularly concerned with orthodoxy. And this becomes a legacy that um, ISIS, which comes directly out of his organization, takes up a whole lot of his people um, were, you know, Baathist military uh, figures um, and other people who like, you know, I, I think it's kind of absurd, you know, that we would think um, an organization uh, like either Al Qaeda or ISIS are like, you have to answer a really rigorous series of uh, religious study questions um, so that we can see before we hand you the suicide vest that like you really understand what we're fighting. Like, no, it doesn't work like that at all. Like once you start finding metaphysical justifications for violence, you attract people who really want to apply those justifications yep. so they can commit some gnarly fucking shit. And that's what happens. And when bin Laden starts to see that, 
he starts communicating in letters first that um, the United States intercepts, and then in at least one case, a public letter that's basically like, you are killing other Muslims. We had a plan here. The plan was supposed to be that we free our, our, our Muslim brothers and sisters from the yoke of their local oppressors in these apostate governments that exist by going after the, the big boss and not the underboss. We want to go after the final boss. We want to go after the United States of America. You are fucking all that up. You're also making people hate us. Like the, the, the story that kind of gets told to a lesser degree in the surge, ironically, not by the people who most directly carry out the surge at senior levels, is that like as bad as the United States fucks up the occupation of Iraq, Al Qaeda fucks it up so much worse. And that yes. provides an opportunity that the United States during this moment known as the surge to capitalize on and get some very fleeting, but, and, you know, if it's only, you know, 500 people being murdered a week, um, I don't know how much, you know, we want to say, you know, that's a lot better, but nevertheless, it was less. Um, that's what kind of gives the surge what little it's ultimately able to accomplish. And that's one of the things I want to kind of get across in mm-hmm. Reign of Terror, that like, not only from an American perspective, is this enemy defined so overwhelmingly broadly, but also the effects of the war on terror, the effects of what the United States does, not only generates new enemies, but makes those enemies vastly worse, vastly more appealing, and vastly more, to some degree yes, to some degree no, potent, or at least more ambitious. Al-Qaeda wasn't really about establishing a caliphate, I was kind of surprised to learn this from figures like Abu Qatada and Abu uh, Muhammad al-Makdisi. Makdisi is one of the most important jihadist, shall we say, one of the most important justifiers of violence um, related around jihad in the late 20th century. He is fighting the Saudis while bin Laden is pledging to defend them. Like, he's that much of an OG. And Mm -hmm. what he says is that, like, we're not qualified to set up a caliphate. Like that's a real serious thing. Like that requires real enlightenment. That requires a whole lot of stuff that isn't in evidence right now. What we're trying to do is fight to get as kind of a bridging mechanism to a point where that might be possible. These psychopaths just declared it. I remember like, a lot of this from 2013. Yeah. Sorry, and like, and like yeah. they're doing this on tops of like rivers of blood. And what I want to, like present in Reign of Terror is a story that accumulates from 20 years of reporting on this that doesn't view the existence of ISIS apart from the war on terror as something that's like the tides that compels you then to just go back and do more of it. But by the going back and doing more of it creates this thing, provides it every opportunity it might want. That's the danger of the that well, there are many dangers of the war on terror, but that's really one of them. Does anyone think there's not going to be an ISIS 2.0 or 3.0 or something like that? It's going to happen if we continue to contribute to the conditions that already allowed it to happen. If the Taliban conquer Kabul, as I think is more likely than not, will Biden do what Obama did and return? the United States to war? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I think that is something that will have a lot of factors behind it, but can't be dismissed out of hand because the way we see particular battlefields of the war on terror drawing to a quote unquote end isn't an end at all. It's a kind of rescission, Mm -hmm. uh, a bivouac, and it always contains both the option and the mechanisms of re-escalation. And in that re-escalation, you sow the seeds of something worse. Does that make sense? Absolutely. My last question here, Spencer, is about not only just write this book, but you also just launched your Substack, um, Forever Wars. So I'm curious, it's 2021. Um, I got into foreign policy at the height of like when it was hot, you know, 
quote unquote, everybody in college was studying Arabic. This wasn't that long ago. Uh, why launch a publication on Forever Wars now in the year 2021? You had a successful gig at the Daily Beast. I was telling you before the show, I've been, literally been reading your stuff for years. Um, so why did you decide to make this jump at this time? Well, I do appreciate that, Sagar. And thank you. Thank you, both you and Marshall very much. I really appreciate um, having such a thoughtful conversation um, with people on the right, given that I'm on the left. Um, I, I hope we all, you know, not just on this you know, podcast, because I'm not going to, you know, invite myself into someone else's house. But I hope, you know, just in generally, you're um, welcome back. You know, anytime, we can, well, I appreciate really that. Enjoy this. But I hope yeah. we can, you know, all of us like continue to to do this, especially when I think we reach, you know, certain points of, of consensus that um, people who are kind of, you know, more liberals or more traditional conservatives or centrists kind of resist on, you know, either side of us. And I'm a newsroom creature more than really anything else. Like if, you know, if you ask me, you know, to kind of like go through the hierarchy of how I understand myself and my identity, like I've just, I'm a reporter. Like I like reporting. Um, we have two ears and one mouth. And I think there's a reason for that. And I had increasingly a hard time coming to terms with all of the compromises that go into working in kind of mainstream newsrooms. And you know, I think it's fair to say, you know, the impact of the pandemic um, changed what I was kind of willing to kind of put up with. And, you know, I don't know what I make of Substack as a company, um, but I have, you know, while I've been doing all of this reporting, you know, had 20 years of experience, more than that. I started doing this when I was 19 years old at, a, you know, long lost New York alt weekly called New York press, which I miss very badly. Um, but having gone through three recessions and the total transformation of journalism into something that just like, doesn't have a viable economic model beyond extremely small scale and extremely large scale, like what you see, like the New York times doing, mm -hmm. um, with basically like acquiring a lot of its major competition, BuzzFeed is basically trying to become a data giant through acquisition. Like, I thought that I want to, if I'm going to continue reporting, if I'm going to continue doing the kind of journalism that I think is worthwhile, I want to do that selling it to people directly. I want to see yeah. if that's a model um, that can sustain my family. I have children, I have elder care responsibilities. I don't know if this is going to work, uh, but I want to try it. I don't want to be on my deathbed saying like, well, at least I compromised my whole life and I always had a boss. <laughs> a lot of well times. Said, yeah, man. Well, thanks very much. No. And yeah, I just want to, I just want to, I just want to hit one thing here because everyone's brand building here. And I just want to, I want to hit your point that you appreciated us talking to even though we're on the right, because we get a lot of like listener input about this. And like, frankly, I, I don't like thinking of this as like a right center, any labeled sort of project there. So I, I, I get considering affiliations why you had that perspective, but I'm just more leaving that for an audience. No, I think there are really important questions here, but I'm not quite sure a traditional looking at this through perspective is particularly useful for. So I just, I just want to hit that. Cause yeah, I think there's, a, totally. I think, I think there's a lot of like critiques of the right and the left in these spaces. That's the whole point about George W. Bush and the security state pre 2001. So I just want to hit that as a editorial note. No, cool. sorry about that. I, 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 uh, I take your point. Fine, Didn't man. mean to be a reductionist about that. I help think it's us brand build Spencer. Yeah. We promote <laughs> the sub stack. Spencer. You, you help it's us promote our brand. <laughs> So, uh, so Spencer, here's the, here's the big question then. Um, so people should go find forever wars on Substack. They should of course pur purchase reign of terror. This is coming out the day of publication. So we want everyone to go look there. What, what is the next immediate few months look like for you when it comes to reporting? What's cool about the Substack model obviously is that you're not turning out quick pieces for advertising based clicks. You're, you're investigating something like what is the thing that's on your table right now? So, um, I am always a little bit leery of talking too much about reporting um, before it's it's finished because like one of the things that reporting ought to do is remain in co kind of inchoate 
because mm -hmm. like you talk to more people and things change, understandings change, you, you dig out new things and so forth. But um, I have been since months before I launched this, pretty much immediately since I left the Daily Beast full time, um, I've been putting together um, what the Forever Wars 9-11 um, 20th anniversary coverage will be. And in particular, I have it rooted. I'm a native New Yorker. I live in New York currently. Um, so as you can imagine, like 9-11, I'm also 41 years old. So I was 21 um, on 9-11. As you can imagine, like this is a searing this is a searing experience for people that I know, for people whom I grew up with, for neighbors of mine. Um, I put I am putting together um, some coverage of 9-11 that I think. I hope um, will go beyond what I think is going to be some really facile and um, euphemistic to the point of propagandistic portrayals of remembering what 9-11 was. Um, and in particular, I'll be telling the stories of people um, inside the United States who found themselves very quickly outside the national consensus, who found themselves as the rest of the country was talking about the need to protect New York and New Yorkers. They learned that they were not the kinds of New Yorkers that were going to be protected, that the authorities presumed them to be and treated them as the sorts of people that they needed to protect New Yorkers from. And I think we run a really great risk of erasing those experiences and those stories. And I want to make sure through Forever Wars that there's a counterweight there that forces that memory, that forces that reckoning. That's the same impulse that led me to write Reign of Terror. Great. Well, I'm really looking forward to it, man. Um, I hope everybody goes supports. We'll have the links down there in the description. Same with the link to the bookshop where they can buy your book. We appreciate you joining us, Spencer. Thank you. Hey, Sagar and Marshall, thank you so much for a great conversation. Thanks, Thanks man.